Hello everyone, my name is Frank. In this video I will present a simple method for the classification of hyperspectral imagery that is acquired by a SPECIM hyperspectral camera in the shortwave infrared and which provides reproducible results. The method uses wavelength mapping to find the wavelength positions of deepest absorption features and simple decision trees for the classification of the wavelength images. This presentation is based on a lunch seminar in the Earth Systems Analysis Department that I gave in November 2017, with the title Rapid Classification of Infrared Hyperspectral Imagery of Rocks with Decision Trees and Wavelength Images. The content of this presentation is as follows. First, I will introduce the SPECIM hyperspectral imagery. And after that, I will uh, show how to do a standard analysis with wavelength mapping and with the standard decision trees. And after that, I will show how you can uh, follow this up with a detailed analysis uh, in the form of a case study of uh, hydrothermally altered rocks from, uh, from Australia. Good, let's start. What you see here is a SPECIM hyperspectral camera. This is uh, a SISU Kema setup, as it is called. And this uh, setup is, uh, is especially made to make high resolution uh, images. So high spatial resolution. The wavelength range is uh, from 1000 to 2500 nanometers, uh, which we call the short wave infrared. And the images that are acquired with this uh, instrument, they, uh, well, they are of variable length, depending on uh, how long you, uh, you keep the uh, camera uh, running. Uh, but the pixels, the number of pixels across is 384. And as I said, with this, uh, uh, with this setup, you can acquire at high spatial resolution. And in this case, it's, uh, each pixel is uh, tw uh, 26 by 26 micrometers. So that's really, really detailed. Um, what you see here is an example of an uh, Sisu Kema image. Um, in the middle, it's a grayscale image, and it shows the uh, reflectance band at 1650 nanometers. Um, yeah, a few dimensions, as I said, uh, the number of pixels across is 384 here. And in this case, we have about uh, 1400 pixels uh, length. Um, this image is uh, created from a uh, slab of a rock, which is a silicified and uh, sericitized dacitic andesite here on the left. And uh, well, the width of this, uh, this image is about uh, one centimeters, one centimeter actually. And uh, what we can do, because it's hyperspectral imagery, we can take one pixel and stack all the, uh, the reflectance bands in one, in one graph, and then we get uh, a reflectance spectrum. And this is a typical uh, reflectance spectrum in this case of, uh, of a fine-grained uh, muscovite. Now you can see the, the features, aluminum hydroxyl feature here to uh, minor features at longer wavelengths, a water, water feature here, and an OH feature here. Um, so this is a high spatial resolution hyperspectral imagery, and it has some, some pros, because it provides detailed information on the mineralogical composition and microstructure of rocks. Uh, it's useful for the characterization of rock type, and also rock forming processes, especially when we're dealing with hydrothermally uh, altered rocks. Uh, the spatial scale is comparable to thin section, uh, so you can easily compare the two and both provide uh, complementary information, so that's very useful. And of course, the, uh, the results uh, give potential input in predictive modeling of chemistry, for instance, ore grade and other uh, and, and physical chemical parameters. Um, some, some cons, uh, some challenges uh, uh, when, when we work with this kind of data, uh, the, the images are typically very large, so more than one gigabyte per image. Um, images contain many pixels so, well, and, and many bands, and so we talk about a million image, uh, pixels per images, a million pixels per image, um, which is too much to, uh, to visually interpret, you can imagine. Um, generation of large volumes of images 
Yeah, that's what often occurs because uh, data acquisition is relatively fast, approximately five minutes for for uh, uh, for one sample. So you can imagine that you can uh, quickly end up with very large volumes. And the interpretation of imagery can be labor intensive, time consuming, and then often subjective. Uh, I'll come to that in a minute uh, about the subjectivity. Um, so, yeah, what we need are methods for rapid and objective assessment of mineralogical composition from the uh, from the hyperspectral images. Uh, um, two other comparisons here: Sisuke uh, map versus high map. Um, on the lower left is, an, is a high map image, yeah, 512 pixels across, um, <laughs> which results in a width of about two kilometers, depending on the pixel size and, the, of course, the, the height that the plane flew, uh, compared to uh, a spectrum image, which is one centimeter across in this case, and uh, a little bit less pixels across. The spectra, they, uh, well, they're somewhat similar, but also different because the wavelength ranges are dif different. The high map sensor includes the visible near infrared and uh, normally on Earth. Um, the water feature and the OH features, they are obscured by the atmosphere, which is not the case if, uh, if we measure uh, in the laboratory with the Sisu Kema system. We can also compare it to an ASD. Um, on the left is, is an ASD with uh, many more, more bands, but yeah, only one point measurement. And uh, on the right is, is the Sisu Kema image. And uh, well, it's, it's just not as detailed, the spectrum is not as detailed as, as the one uh, measured with the ASD and slightly more, uh, more noise. Okay, so you have now some, some, uh, some, some reference uh, to place the Sisu Kema system into. Um, so we have a hyperspectral uh, image that needs to be classified and many strategies that are known in the literature involve spectral matching of the image and reference spectra and subsequent thresholding. Uh, for instance, the spectral angle mapper, which is a widely known uh, method of matching uh, where you calculate spectral angle between a reference and an unknown spectrum and the lower the angle, the better the match. And if you want to then threshold, um, it will classify uh, according to that particular spectrum, you have to choose an, uh, a threshold of the of the angle, where below that value, the mineral is classified as, as that particular uh, spectrum. And if it if it, uh, the the spectral angle is higher, then uh, it will be uh, it must be another mineral. Um, limitations of these these methods are that you need to have uh, a priori knowledge of a scene for the selection of reference spectra because you're matching unknown spectra with reference spectra. Uh, and the matching statistics doesn't show, uh, well, they do not show which part of the spectrum matches best, whether that's really the shape of the hull or the wavelength position of the absorption feature, and which does not. Uh, and the selection, as I said, of a threshold of a, for a match is rather subjective because you have to select a uh, threshold for the angle and uh, the question is, what do you base it on? Yeah, that, that makes it a little bit subjective. And this is an example of, of a matching of two spectra. Um, so if you calculate the spectral angle, for instance, then uh, uh, the, the mean spectral angle was calculated. So you end up with one figure, one matching uh, number for, for, for the match of all these bands. So you don't have any idea of uh, whether, for instance, the wavelength position here matches well or not. And that's important because uh, often the exact wavelength position of absorption features is, is diagnostic for, for minerals because they are directly related to uh, the molecular bonds in the crystal lattice. Good. So, therefore, we have an alternative approach. Uh, some characteristics of this approach. It's a quick first assessment of mineralogy. You don't, you don't need any a priori information on mineralogy of the rock sample. Um, the focus is on mineral absorption features, so which, as I said, uh, well, everybody knows that. I mean, who's familiar with the matter? They are diag diagnostic for many minerals, unlike the hull shape. 
um, the interpretation is objective and reproducible and you can uh, build up uh, knowledge of uh, mineralogical composition step by step by first starting with a general approach and then increasingly add detail to make a more detailed interpretation. And uh, this method is based on wavelength mapping and subsequent classification by decision trees. Right, first a little bit on wavelength mapping. Uh, there are some, some papers on that, but I'll just quickly uh, uh, summarize um, how it works. So what wavelength mapping does is it, it, uh, takes the con uh, it removes normally the continuum of a reflectance spectrum between uh, a start and an uh, end uh, wavelength range um, of a wavelength range. And then uh, it finds uh, absorption features and then uh, tries to fit a parabola through the three lowest reflectance values of that absorption feature, as you can see here. Um, and these, these dots, they are uh, the reflectance uh, measurements for, for each band in, in an image uh, of this particular pixel. Um, so a function of the parabola is here. Yeah, that is a well-known uh, function of, uh, of an, uh, a parabola with this shape. Um, well, um, what you then can, can try to, to find is the, the minimum of the, uh, the fitted uh, parabola. Uh, there the derivative is zero. So you can rework the formula and then you get the the wavelength position of the minimum is the minus b over uh, 2a, yeah, which, which comes from this, uh, this formula. So b and a are known, so uh, with this formula you can then calculate the wavelength position of the minimum. Um, okay, so that's one. We have the, uh, the wavelength position, but we also want to know the depth of the absorption feature, and the depth is the one, uh, which, it, which is the, the continuum uh, minus the, the depth uh, at, the, fee, at the, the minimum of this feature. Okay, so we have two, two values here um, in this case. If we go to a real spectrum, um, we cannot, uh, well, we don't have to look for only the deepest feature, but we can also look for the second and the third uh, deepest feature. Um, so here we have a spectrum and between 2.1 and 2.4, we have three absorption features. Uh, here it is enlarged. And um, with a wavelength mapping software, we can find uh, the wavelength positions of uh, the three deepest features and the associated depths. And then we get a W1 and a D1, which are the, the wavelength position of the deepest feature. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the depth of the deepest feature, and then we have a W2 and a D2 of the second deepest feature, and a W3 and a D3 of the third deepest feature. And uh, you can continue, of course, but uh, mostly, uh, most of the times, one absorption uh, feature is, uh, uh, is useful. Two are, are even better. Sometimes we need three, but uh, well, if you if you uh, measure too many wavelength positions of too many features, then it becomes very complicated to, to interpret. Um, okay, but for now we we only look at the uh, the deepest feature. Um, so uh, that has then a wavelength position in this case. Uh, what was done here between two point well, two thousand one hundred and two thousand four hundred nanometer. And then we add a color scale to uh, show the different wavelength positions in different colors. Um, and the image that we refer to here is a wavelength image. Yeah, so it only shows only the wavelength positions of the deepest uh, feature. Um, what we can then also use is the depth of the, the, the deepest absorption feature, uh, which is here shown on, on the left. Um, you can see that there are some saw marks uh, still here, so this is not uh, anything like uh, foliation or so. Um, and we can uh, use this depth image as an intensity layer that we can fuse together with the wavelength position, which, which then gives the U. So 
the wavelength position gives the U and the, the depth gives the intensity and then I fuse the two and I get this image which shows in color the wavelength position and then uh, the, the intensity is the depth. So the very shallow features become black and the deep features they become brighter. And this is a very useful uh, image to, uh, to do an exploratory analysis because it combines the, a lot of uh, uh, diversity in the wavelength position positions but also in the intensity and that, that, that seems to be a very useful combination. Um, if you want to know more of how to do it yourself there is on the Frank's Tutorials website there is a uh, tutorial an exercise called uh, Spectral Mineralogy of the Porphyry Copper Pebble where it's all explained. There's some limitations to wavelength mapping it's only for exploratory analysis you do not end up with a mineral map. It's what you show is just a diversity of well, of minerals, uh, but you cannot immediately link a, a color to a mineral, uh, to a group of minerals. Yes, but not to specific minerals because you only look at one one absorption feature. Um, with the standard stretch, uh, the small variation in wavelength positions they they often are not directly visible. So you need to do some further stretching uh, of the wavelength position. Um, and deep absorption features dominate over shallow features. So the shallow features, they don't get a lot of attention in contrast to the deep features, which can be useful, but sometimes it's not desired. Yes, so, um, so we want to do a bit more. Yeah, so we do not only want to have a wavelength map for image, but we also want to come up with a classification um, where we can um, sort of uh, solve some of the, uh, the limitations of the wavelength mapping. So what we can do, we can slice the wavelength images using wavelength intervals that enhance the contrast between minerals and mineral groups. Right, so this is an example. So here we have the same same image in the center of the same rock. This is a depth image and this is a wavelength image. So here it has not been fused yet, but this uh, this gives you, uh, um, well, it actually it's not, <laughs> it's already a classified wavelength image, I should say. Um, so um, yeah, let's, let's first to go to this, this scatter plot um, to make it a bit clearer, because what we plot here is uh, the depth of the deepest feature of each pixel uh, on the x-axis going from 2100 to 2400 nanometers and on the y-axis is the interpolated depth yeah, so you rem remember that's the w1 and the d1 um, that was calculated with uh, the wavelength mapping uh, and, th and this is a scatter plot so it shows all the pixels in the image um, and it shows the values of these two uh, parameters. And you can see that there are three, three uh, concentrations of pixels. One here, one here, and one here. And you can see that the, the depth of the feature is between 0 0.1 and 0 0.35. So that's about 25% uh, variation. And almost similar to, to, the fe to the features here. And also the similar, almost similar to the features here. This is slightly longer than 2200 nanometers so it's most likely aluminium hydroxyl uh, feature that you see here um, this is approximately 2250 which is probably related to iron the hydroxyl feature and then uh, the third uh, concentration of pixels is at 2350 approximately related to most likely in this case uh, magnesium hydroxyl features but it can also be carbonate, for instance. Um, so th the simplest thing to do now is, if you want to classify this, uh, slice the image into two intervals, or using two intervals into, into three classes. Then we can separate uh, this cluster from the rest by uh, slicing at a value here, for instance, 2,225, and we can uh, further Simplify these and these by slicing at uh, 2300. And that's very simple. Um, but if you do that, you get an, an immediately a classified map which shows each of these clusters in different colors. Now that's, uh, that's quite useful. 
Um, so, and we use a decision tree for that. Uh, we, uh, we start with, with all the pixels here. So this is done in Envy uh, in hyperspectral Python. In Hippie, there will be functionality. Uh, well, functionality is coming that can do the same. Uh, but this is in, in MV. So we, end, we start with all the pixels here. Uh, first, we say, well, we want to uh, separate all the pixels that are aspectral, so that do not have any clear absorption features. Um, so we say, is the, well, the decision we take here is the, uh, the depth of the deepest feature larger than 5%. If that's yes, you go here, and if no, you go here. So in black are all the pixels that have uh, absorption features that are shallower than 5%, uh, but it's in fact 0% in this image. So each pixel has, uh, has an absorption feature, and that's also something you can see from the, uh, from the scatter plot here. Yeah, so all pixels have at least uh, well, 10% reflectance of higher or higher the, the features, the depth of the features. Yes, so um, then we are here, and then we can uh, slice according to the first threshold here, saying, uh, okay, is my uh, wavelength position of the deepest feature larger than 2,225? Uh, 2, if it's yes, we go here. If it's no, then it is uh, uh, shorter than 2,225. And then you end up here. So these are the yellow pixels. And you can see that the in the in the classified image, they form a nice yellow uh, semicircular uh, objects. Um, and then we can ask ourselves the, the, the third question. Um, is the wavelength position uh, larger than 2300? If we say yes, the pixels end up here, which is about 16% of the, of the image. If no, we end up here. Um, okay, so this is a very simple classification uh, and very efficient. And in yellow, well, if we look at these pixels and look at the spectra, they are um, uh, sericides, that's fine, grain muscovite. Um, and so that's also what we can see with uh, under uh, under a microscope on uh, on a thin section. And this is uh, well, this it's called an amygdala um, because it's an amygdaloidal uh, rock, which means it has vesicles which have been filled by some some sort of mineral quartz, sericide. It can be anything. Um, a bit of a complicated name. The amygdala. Um, okay, so uh, the amygdals are, are filled with, with uh, the sericide. Uh, the matrix, it's a volcanic rock, uh, so the fine grain matrix is mostly chlorotized uh, in green here, so uh, because of the iron hydroxyl feature. And purple is in this case uh, also chloride, but then uh, where the magnesium hydroxyl feature is deeper. So that's basically what, uh, what we're looking at here. Okay, so that's the principle. Um, we can design more uh, complicated or extensive decision trees. I mean, the decision trees are still very simple because they're all based on the yes and no uh, decisions. Um, and they're quite easy to, to follow, but you can make them quite big, quite large. And uh, what we have done, we have created uh, four different uh, standard decision trees for the classification of four different wavelength ranges. Uh, so uh, the wavelength ranges are shown here. Um, uh, this is the most uh, diagnostic between two, uh, 2100 and 2400 nanometers. Um, but the other wavelength ranges also give us uh, useful information. And the classes that, that, that uh, were created were, were based on an analysis of uh, more than 400 uh, mineral spectra of the USDS spectral library. So let's have a look at what they look like. Well, these are the decision trees. Yeah, so this, uh, the decision tree between 2100 and 2400 is, is most, uh, well, is the largest with most uh, nodes. Um, And it uses the deepest absorption features 
and the depth, the, the, the second deep absorption features for a classification. Well, I mean, you don't have to understand all the uh, all the nodes and, and all the decision decisions in this tree because that takes a bit too long to explain. Um, but we'll look at some some examples. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea of uh, of what these uh, trees look like. Uh, so the one uh, for the wavelength range between uh, 1650 and 1850 is really simple, and uh, it's basically used to um, to identify sulfates like gypsum, alunite, and gerosite because they have uh, typical absorption features there. Uh, and a few other minerals. Um, yeah, so um, so let's have a look at some uh, at an example if we apply these uh, these decision trees. Uh, here we have the uh, um, another rock, which is again a uh, volcanic rock, silicified, sericitized, amygdaloidal andesite in this case. Yeah, the width of the image is uh, one centimeter, so it's again very detailed, uh, a detailed image. Um, the image on the left shows the reflectance at 1650 nanometers. Um, this is uh, the result of the decision tree uh, between 1300 and 1600 nanometers, this one between 1650 and 1850 nanometers, and here you can see that. Uh, the pixels within the uh, amygdals, they have been classified as yellow, where the deepest absorption features between 1800 and 1840 nanometers, and the re remainder, I mean, the rest of the pixels all have features that are shallower than, than 5%, that's why they're black. Uh, the water feature here is uh, really not so uh, um, diagnostic, well, it doesn't vary very much. It's all green and it's uh, common for many, many minerals. Um, on the other hand, the classification of the wavelength range between uh, 2100 and 2400 nanometers shows quite some useful very vari nice variation. Um, if we uh, look at the yellow pixels, they are um, pixels with the deepest absorption feature between 2200 and 2210, and the second deepest feature of 2340 and 2000. For, uh, 400. Yeah, so this is a typical of a deepest feature of, of uh, elite muscovite, and this is the second deepest feature of elite muscovite. If we look at the matrix, which is orange, yeah, we have the same same type of uh, uh, wavelength positions, uh, except that the the, long, the the deepest feature is slightly longer. That's yeah, in the class 2210 to 2000. 220, uh, so slightly less aluminium rich elite muscovite normally. Um, and then we have these, these greenish uh, pixels. That's interesting because the deepest feature is between 2200 and 2210, similar as the, uh, the yellow. But then the second deepest feature is between 2160 and 2280, which is shorter. And then in the, in the yellow and the orange uh, pixels. And that is typical for, for, for instance, uh, kaolinite. So let's have a look at the spectrum of one of those green pixels. And indeed, you can see here the deepest feature uh, at 2200, um, well, between 2200 and 2210. And the second deepest feature is here at shorter wavelengths. If you would have calculated the third or the fourth feature, then we would end up also with these two. So, in fact, that could be useful information to uh, to identify kaolinite. Um, the feature between 1650 and 1850 is, is this one. Right? That is the, uh, the one which is typical for kaolinite, but that's shown here in yellow. And the green is because of this feature, and then this green is... Uh, because of this feature, which also varies here between uh, kaolinite and uh, and the elite muscovite. Okay, so that's how it works, and this, so this is quite easy. So you make a wavelength image, uh, you apply a decision tree, and then you end up with this classification, which can be 
readily be interpreted. And then you can not only, I mean, you can take the same decision tree and uh, apply them to all your other samples. And you always get the, the, the same result. Because normally the wavelength positions, they don't change. Sometimes the, the shape of the hole changes because of different calibration. But normally, if the reflective spectra are, are wavelength calibrated, then uh, yeah, you should get a consistent result. And that is nice, because we want to have consistent reproducible results when we interpret uh, hyperspectral images. So, um, and yeah, the interpretation of the classes, or well, you have to look then at the, the wavelength positions. If you're not 100% sure, you can also apply the same decision trees to any spectral library of, of, of samples from your area that, uh, that you know, that are known, um, and then uh, optimize the, the, the interpretation. Of course, you can also take a mean spectrum of, of one class in one image and you can then again try to match that using a spectral angle mapper or any other matching software. Okay, so um, in this case it was compared with the classification of USGS spectral library uh, spectra and uh, for these three different classes we can uh, we end up with uh, well, a short list of, of candidate spectra. For the one on the right, yeah, it's mostly a halozide, kaolinite, and, 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 and dickite um, that fall into this, uh, this class, so that's relatively easy. Uh, the orange class is uh, predominantly muscovite, montmorillonite, elite, some chalcedony, a few other minerals. And the yellow is predominantly muscovite, montmorillonite, well, lepidolite, elite, etc. Yeah, so still you, ha you have to uh, make a further selection uh, from this, uh, this short list. So we're not there yet. Um, but you have confined your search quite a bit and you have a very nice uh, classification which shows uh, coherent, uh, coherent objects. Okay, well, and compare with, with thin, thin section analysis, but then <laughs> it's a bit difficult to see the difference between kaolinite and a fine grain cirrusite, for instance. So that's where you need uh, hyperspectral imagery, imagery. So some limitations of this, uh, the second step with the decision trees. Um, um, still only first assessment, more detailed analysis may be required uh, because we have to only use the sort of standardized uh, decision trees. Um, it's to up to now basically uh, based solely on, on wavelengths of absorption features, so no other information. So uh, other information such as the shape of the hull, um, inflection points, relative depth of two features, they are not incorporated in the, in the analysis. And, and of course, some end members may be missed, end members of sh shallow with shallow absorption features, for instance. Well, we cannot solve everything. Uh, but let's see if we can solve some of these limitations by doing a uh, detailed image analysis. So some coffee may be required to follow the last part of the uh, of the presentation about detailed image analysis. Uh, so the next step, the objective is to to optimize decision tree, the decision tree for specific uh, sample sets. So what we can do here is enhancements of the, the spectral variation in wavelength images and methods for that. Uh, calculation of summary products, such as the illite and kaolinite crystallinities, ferrous drops. So we can do that by calculating of, of summary products. Um, doing uh, visual spatial analysis of contrast enhanced images and, and see if um, if any other uh, useful information comes out of that. The analysis of, of regions of interest uh, themselves, so actually the classes, um, or, or really manually drawn uh, regions of interest. And you can uh, calculate spectra, uh, scatter plots, etc. And you can improve the, the slicing intervals and, and uh, up, make an update uh, of the decision tree. So let's see. Let's have a look at, at, at an example. 
we uh, have the, the same image again of the volcanic rock, uh, salicylate, seriesitized uh, rock. Um, first, we have an albedo image at 1650 nanometers. Um, then, with the standard cl uh, standard decision tree, is classified uh, like this. Yeah, so it's basically one class with with some other uh, pixels here. Um, what we can do, we can make a color composite of the first, the second, and the third deepest absorption features. Uh, this is, for instance, between 1850 and 2100 nanometer, which is the, the water wavelength uh, range. Um, and you can see that there's quite a lot of contrast that we have not incorporated yet in this uh, standard uh, classified uh, image. So that's something we have to do. Um, so it has to do with the, the water feature, um, and what would be logical here is to, to calculate uh, a crystallinity value by dividing the depth of the aluminium hydroxyl feature over the water feature, yeah, so uh, according to that formula. And then we end up with this very nice image, which shows uh, uh, some um, objects here with a high crystallinity, some objects with a very low crystallinity, and the matrix which has some intermediate values. That's interesting. Um, so if we then um, draw regions of interests of some selected objects, then we see we can see that the crystallinity values uh, vary quite a lot. Um, so the ones with high crystallinity here, they have deep features and shallow water uh, water features. So deep aluminum hydroxyl features and shallow water feature. Uh, the black one here with the low crystallinity, and they have a much shallower feature at uh, 2200 and then, uh, well, similar or slightly deeper water features. Okay. Um, then for all the pixels, we can plot the, the, the wavelength position of the deepest feature vary uh, uh, versus the, the crystallinity the elite crystallinity, and then you can see that the phenocrysts, they have much higher crystallinity values than the xenocrysts. Yeah, so those are the crystals that are um, uh, coming from outside the magma, so they're fragments taken from, from, from uh, other rocks. Um, crystals that have been resorbed, and that's why they are round. You can see that these, uh, these crystals are round here. While the phenocrysts, they uh, well, they are actually um, seriesite altered uh, feldspar uh, leads. And then in between there's the matrix, which has an intermediate crystallinity. Now that's interesting, because we can then um, slice uh, the uh, elite the crystallinity values using uh, some thresholds, uh, 3.2 and 2. Oh, it's 3.25, yes. Okay, and when we do that, we end up with, with this class classification. Uh, instead of this homogeneously uh, yellow uh, image, we get now an image which shows uh, the matrix in yellow, uh, the well-ordered elite muscovite phenocrysts in, in cyan, and the poorly ordered elite muscovite in gray. And well, we can also compare this with uh, the thin section analysis, and it, uh, it, it, it makes sense. Uh, the phenocrysts, indeed, they have a different shape uh, than, uh, than, for instance, the xenocrysts, which are more uh, rounded. Um, okay, so this is an improvement, and it also shows very nicely volcanic texture here in this uh, in this rock. Um, then I show an example uh, from the foot wall of an. Uh, and a massive sulfide, volcanic house of massive sulfide deposit. Uh, what we see here in this map is a uh, volcanic sequence. This is the top of the sequence, this is the bottom of the sequence. Everything is tilted and eroded and is now nicely exposed. So this is the top of the sequence, which is overlain by, by sediments. Uh, this is the position of the VMS uh, copper zinc deposit. And in black is a chert layer, which is very typical here, which marks the, let's say, the stratigraphic level where um, well, hydrothermal discharge uh, took place in, uh, in the past and where these uh, massive sulfide mineralizations were formed. 
and there is a series of uh, different alteration zones in the foot wall and this transact from three sample three up to 14 cross cuts the different alteration zones um, okay and these are the samples the same uh, samples as indicated uh, uh, on, on the right um, different types of, of volcanic rocks all uh, strongly altered, seriously dyed, stilicified, and but, but also chloritized. Only the first one is not a volcanic rock, this is a sedimentary rock which has been uh, stilicified into uh, a chert. Okay, and this is what they look like at the insection, well, especially the, the samples from the chloride uh, alteration zone, this greenish zone, they are uh, yeah, much darker, they have a much darker color than, than the other samples. Um, so yeah on the left uh, those are uh, scans with the Speckheim hyperspectral camera um, at the 26 uh, micrometers resolution, spatial resolution. Um, well you can see most of the samples, the volcanic texture, here you can see the sedimentary layering of the, of the, of the, of the chert. And uh, when we apply the, the standard classification, so we do first the wavelength uh, mapping and from the wavelength images, we, uh, we, uh, we classify, um, well, the cl we classify the, uh, the wavelength images using the decision trees into, uh, into these uh, standardized uh, classifications. Um, so this is uh, only based on the wavelength positions and not on any other uh, calculated summary products. Uh, what we then can immediately see is that we have a zonation into uh, more aluminium rich uh, muscovites here, aluminium poor muscovites here, there's some kaolinite in these uh, amygdales. Um, and if we and here we, uh, we end up with three samples with more uh, chloride, especially the, the, the second one, B2013, uh, uh, contains abundant uh, iron chloride. Uh, in the, in the first uh, there is uh, well, P2012, there is a bit more alum aluminium poor elite muscovite present and in this one, um, in the last one, P2014, there is uh, a different chloride and there's also some, some uh, elite muscovite rich uh, amygdals. Okay, um, and then what else is there to say about this? Yeah. Well, the chert consists mostly of silica, but uh, there is also some uh, fine-grained illite uh, in the rock, which is shown by this hyperspectral classification. Then we can add the, um, the illite crystallinity, which has been sliced, um, and also kaolinite uh, crystallinity, which has also been calculated, but that's what I have not shown. Um, and then we can see in uh, a further subdivision into uh, different types of illite muscovite based on the based on the crystallinity, and it shows uh, now very nicely the uh, the volcanic texture, yeah, which we have not seen in the uh, in the standard classification. And so it shows that uh, standard classification using standard decision trees is useful and shows already a lot about the mineralogy, uh, but you can optimize it um, by making an uh, by calculating summary products and, and um, optimizing decision trees and then you get uh, um, a more specific decision tree uh, specific to this, this particular uh, data set. And it shows very nicely now different phenocryst, uh, xenocryst and amygdals. Um, and then of course this, uh, uh, this offers then the opportunity to also do something with the uh, volcanic texture or the texture in general. So you can uh, calculate uh, uh, microstructural um, attributes from these from these images, but that's uh, that's another story, and that should be told some other time. But we don't have time for that anymore because it's become uh, it has become quite a lengthy talk. Okay, then uh, let's go to the summary. Um, yeah, so um, we had these, these these wavelength images. Uh, they have been sliced uh, um, with decision trees 
uh, over the different uh, different wavelength ranges, and that uh, provided uh, a, a method for for a quick and reproducible assessment of high resolution uh, spectrum imagery. Yeah, we we've seen that. Um, complement complementary spectral information can be included by calculation of summary products, for instance, in light uh, muscovite crystallinity. And the result is a series of, of detailed mineral maps. And the nice thing is that these, that, uh, these uh, decision trees can be, uh, can be applied to other data sets or other sample sets from the same area, but also from other areas. And each time you run it, you get exactly the same result. Then some useful references, um, if you want to know more about this. First one is uh, mapping the wavelength position of deepest absorption features to explore mineral diversity in hyperspectral images. That explains the uh, wavelength mapping over different wavelength ranges with an example from uh, hyperspectral images from Mars. Then there is uh, a tutorial, spectral absorption feature analysis for finding ore, a tutorial on using the method in geological remote sensing. Um, there's also a section on, on wavelength mapping incorporated in that uh, publication. And the third one is measuring rock microstructure in hyperspectral mineral maps, where uh, this described how to uh, um, how to measure uh, microstructure from the classified uh, images that we ended up with. Um, and in that way to, to quantify a microstructure. Okay, so that was uh, it's the end of the, uh, of the talk. I hope you found it interesting, useful, and uh, maybe I see you uh, some other time in another video. Goodbye.